Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Special Economics Seminar Series 7. And today, we are very happy to have Dr. Fabian Thies from Germany. And briefly, Dr. Thies received his PhD in computer science and uh, also mathematics, physics, biophysics, a couple uh, interdisciplinary fields. Uh, and then he did a postdoc in biophysics at the University of Regensburg. Then after postdoc, he was a Bernstein Fellow as an independent researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. Then after that, he joined um, uh, Technische Technisch University of München, the München, München University. And, and since then, uh, he has been an associate professor and professor. And recently, he is the, uh, then he also recently is a leader uh, at the uh, Hamburg uh, Zentrum München in Germany as well. And uh, so uh, today he's going to talk about uh, the spatial omics and computational methods. And sorry, my German is. <laughs> Not uh, very easy. To, that's why I'm uh, having a hard time in the uh, descriptions. But well, I think that was not bad at all. Thanks. <laughs> okay, sounds great. But uh, but without I think further ado, I'd like to actually turn over to Dr. Tis, please. Okay. Yeah, and thank thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, Ahmed and uh, Ron and, and everyone for invitation, and particularly also for coming and, and and listening. I want to briefly sort of give an outline over a few topics that we've been doing, extending essentially. Uh, some of these analysis tools that, that we've been working on in the disassociated setting to the spatial setting. Um, I prepared something like 40, 45 minutes, but do let me know if this is too much or if I, if I cut short. And I would be also happy to take questions in between and sort of keep this a bit informal if people want to ask. So I have like sort of a few natural breaks and I can, can raise discussion if you want, or you can do it at the end, depending on how you want to do that. Uh, so let, let, me, let me share my screen. So what I, what I want to talk about is uh, work um, on, on learning spatial components from electric tissue biology. And actually, I just realized this was a talk that I actually gave together with Joanny some time ago. So I should actually update that when we spoke about squid pie. <laughs> uh, all right. So let, let me briefly get started. What my lab is in general interested in is, I guess, as, as many of us, um, how cells make decisions and potentially have this as an underpinning of, of health and disease. And as a, as a more computation oriented person, I still find it so fascinating that those cells are like little computers in a sense, right? Depending on what input they get, they make decisions whether to survive, to differentiate, proliferate, die, and, and so on. It's like, it's like a little, little stochastic computer. And what does understanding then mean of these computers? Maybe it's sufficient if you understand how it behaves under perturbations, under local context, and so on. So this, this initial early on notion that we have of having always first principles, you know, I'm coming from physics, so it's very built in that you can sort of really pin this down to very basic principles. Maybe that's not how these complex systems work. Maybe it's really good if we understand how uh, many perturbations this, this works. That's maybe a, a fair enough game. So I think with particularly the disassociated case of, of single cell genomics becoming so popular, we can really start studying perturbations on a large scale and if we have many perturbations, we can start building these things. I think in the spatial case, it's gonna be a tad more exciting because then you also have this, this, this context. But in any case, my lab has been then really putting some time into modeling this first, this space of what a state could actually mean. That could be a big transcript home, could be rna seq plus attack or protein, or could be also a spatial context. And then uh, often trying to, to build models, not only of describing the space, but also making it sort of a function of, of some previous state. So trying to see where it goes, potentially under perturbation. I won't be showing much formulas, but sort of my little conceptual ones, what the typical model should be that we try to approach with machine learning. Um, here's another, another sort of visualization of, of this thing, again, in disassociated settings. I think it's kind of kind of exciting how, how these, these cells sort of go through their lifetime um, and then sort of in, in, in bad cases turn off and become cancerous or turn into one or the other type of, of disease situations. And in a very naive type of way, we can think about them sort of going through trajectories and maybe at some point take the wrong trajectory. And what's exciting is, is that we can really build these models that we can really sort of interpolate those trajectories because we have so many samples. 
when we started doing normal RNA seq, it was always when stats called small and large p, very few actual samples of variation. Now with these many cells, you know, we can actually sample these what a machine learning we then call latent spaces. So these submanifolds, these Waddington's landscapes in a sense, where they would be going along. And since we since we have this, we can maybe see whether we should go turn, take a wrong turn, and can make potentially be able to intercept. So that's the idea. And for this, of course, you want to use machine learning techniques first for learning this space, and then maybe for learning also this behavior of the perturbation. Mm. So this is a general setting, what we want to do in my lab. Um, more specific, we've been also building infrastructure to enable these things, particularly in disassociated settings. So just as a brief primer before I go to the spatial case, we've been working very much first just to get our lab organized in, in terms of our own analysis. And it's been taken up quite well by the community with the ScanPy software. We've been having an epigenetic version of that. And more recently I contributed a spatial extension. You can see my, my lab, uh, my PhD is essentially trying be really funny because this scan pie sounds like a scampi. So we've been thinking about how do we extend this one to the spatial. So they came up with another spatial quantification. So stay to the seafood uh, uh, label. Yeah, that was a joke. Um, and then we also also went into um, organizing data management part of that. And this has been tremendously useful for us for benchmarking software and uh, algorithms and comparing them. And we've been actually contributing a few of these benchmarks as well recently, because you have also this, this very nice infrastructure for loading many samples at the same time in a decentralized fashion. We've been doing some, some additional things such as velocity analysis and also comparison of, of these things at, at benchmark uh, uh, big machine learning conferences. So that's sort of on, on the, the infrastructure side. Um, but let me now talk about the, the, the analysis point of things. And here, uh, again, taking a step back, right? This how long has this been going on? Ahmed now is like a year series or something like that, or, or, or even one and a half years. Series seven, I heard. I, I think it's, I mean, this is like an old thing. How did we all get into single cellology? At least how did this field start? It started from the microscopy. Obviously, that's how cells have been found, right? And then there was this omics biology at the time being just bulk. And then it just sort of merged into one thing. This, by the way, is an older review from Alex van Udenaar, beautifully named Every Cell is Special. Really, really like that. And uh, I think it's kind of nice how these things converged. And you know, now we're sort of going back again and trying to add space, for example, with spatial transcriptomics within C2 and, and so on. And yeah, this has been, of course, also recognized. So I think it's an exciting time to then add now context to these disassociated settings. You know, we've been always, I think, I think a very common analysis nowadays in this disassociated case, once we have been building our atlases, always trying to understand which cells communicate with each other. But let's be honest, like this. These methods such as cell phone to be cell chat or what's it called, niche net, um, they all just go based on legal receptor interactions of this sort of case. If you have spatial resolution, you can actually ask much more about the architecture, uh, real tissue structure, and so on. So I think it's really exciting to do this. This is from an, an old review from, from Aviv and, and Yosef. They've been describing what the typical analysis in a disassociated case would be. You, for example, look for cell types. So you sort of look for different axes of variation. Cell types, that's a very common thing for clustering. Maybe a continuous phenotype such as cell cycle or gradient, differentiation trajectories. Uh, yeah, cell cycle, maybe also a little bit spatial position. At the time, it was always just anchoring on in situ images. And I would, uh, I would just like to add sort of this one arrow that was maybe not so clear at the time is because we want to build the atlases, actually one very big variation we have, in addition to, of course, a perturbation would be just one experiment across multiple batches and labs. You know, this is something we know how to deal now with in the single cell setting. And I think there are quite a bit of effort of the computational single cell community has been going into methods for doing this data integration in the recent few years. Essentially trying to answer this question that when you build an atlas, you know, in one lab, it would look like that. Just cluster, you get your cell type. But if you do this now in multiple labs, it usually looks like that. So they don't actually overlap as nicely as you'd want because there's going to be some sampling artifact and things like that. So very often, you want to do something what we can call data integration to really map this, make the cell types map onto each other, but still hopefully uh, retain also biological liberation. It's a quite interesting trade off. A lot of methods have been proposed, and you can, for example, also benchmarking this. So, this is sort of what you would be doing in the, in the single cell setting without spatial context. I might, I, I mentioned this a little bit later also with respect to what type of methods can be used, because I think that's exciting for what we would be doing and also in the spatial setting. Because I think at the moment, if you're really honest, it's gonna be very hard to even think about how we would be looking at architecture in one lab against another and then try to see what type of patterns are reoccurring. It's very hard, right? Because we don't have this equivalent of a cell type cluster or something like that. 
Right. So what's this? What's the equivalent of this? This plot of of act in the spatial setting. Together with uh, Aviv Regev, we've been coming up with this nomenclature or, or sort of a perspective um, that, that we recent, recent, recently published. We've been thinking, you know, if we have spatial context, you know, there's all kinds of additional variations we can look for. We can look for variation across covariates, of course. We can look, for example, at cell morphology, right? If you have a very detailed spatial essay, it obviously depends on the essay. And from what I understood, Rong and Ahmed had all kinds of presentations in, in the seminar where you have something maybe very detailed, maybe even with subcellular gene expression. You know, I mean, some of the fish-based essays, maybe you can really look if it's in cytosol or nucleus, or maybe in a particular organ now, or just like, you know, gene expression across cells in a spatial context. Or, you know, you add spatial dependencies, very local ones, such as cell-cell -cell interactions, that would be this sort of true cell interaction thing that goes beyond just this little receptor associations that we do in this associated case, or also of which cells sort of form tissue modules, which sort of co-occur locally, things like that. So I think it's exciting, and in order to, to, to analyze this, of course, then you need to add this spatial dimension into, into the analysis. And depending on what scale your essay has, you can ask different questions. And yeah, I, I think we had this, this discussion already before, just in the chat, Lana, right? You called it a wild west. And I think that's pretty much what we still have here as well, right? I mean, you know, depending on the technique, you might just not even just see this little variation because in Visium, it's just like average over 10 cells. You know, this thing you just like won't see. In other cases, maybe you don't have such a high resolution to really pick up the different cell types. I think once we have this spatial context, this sort of a little bit of output what we put in this, this perspective, maybe we can, similarly as to sorting cells by similarity in, in the gene expression space, now look in the spatial context as well and maybe see what cell differentiation happens across space. And people have been using similar types of techniques here in that setting to yeah, get something like spatial trajectories or something like that. And, you know, I think it might be exciting. You know, in this case, for example, um, many of us have been you know, trying to think how to add vector fields on top of that, where cells would go with the next step, for example, based on RNA velocity, metabolic labeling, and so on. How can we apply this in this case? I think it's going to be exciting. Um, so here, we've been trying to summarize a little bit the challenges and opportunities of, of, of these analysis, so just trying to sort of categorize computational approaches. I think the first approach, obviously depends on very much on the essay that's being chosen, but definitely will be involved in image processing, segmentation, registration across multiple slides, and just building a data structure that can actually hold all of that. If you have a very cost-grained essay, you might want to add deconvolution and integrate data sets, very popular and quite a few methods being proposed, such as tangram, cell to location, and so on. Maybe do multimodal analysis. That might be still disassociated, but I think increasingly we're also going to see multimodal spatial assays. And you, know, you want to do a similar as we do in the disassociated case. And then you want to test for what's actually varying. You want to look for variable features within a data set, also differential. And then, of course, also do the cell and neighborhood analysis, really sort of have a graph of neighboring cells and see what type of interactions are happening there. And last but not least, once we have all of this, as you would be doing in the disassociated case, of course, then design new experiments. Ask, you know, particularly with these expensive visions and so on, we should be saying, hey, how many samples do we actually need to make this finding and that? And you know, can I maybe vary individuals? Can I maybe do association and so on? So I, th I think that's sort of a rough overview of what can be done. And in this, uh, uh, in this talk, I want to present three, two, if you have time, four vignettes for people contributing my lab early on, on a processing case uh, where we've been actually trying to think how we design probe sets in the targeted uh, spatial setting. I will be showing a little bit how we analyze cellular neighborhood using a graph neural network based approach. It's a tad technical, but I try to sort of make it hopefully enough lightweight to, to get that across. I think it's really an exciting approach to learn about how cells interact in the spatial setting. So adding the spatial context as a covariate. And then I suppose speak about this, this analysis framework that we've been building together, which is sort of a backbone for many analysis that we do, and that might be interesting also for your lab if you want to do spatial analysis, which we got script. All right. So uh, let, let, let me get, get started. Unless there are, so that's something people want to discuss on, on that sort of general overview slide. I think it's okay, right? Okay. So um, the first thing that I want to show is work by uh, Louis Kuhlman, a PhD student in the lab who's been working together with Malte, a senior postdoc, where we've been uh, asking how to design probe sets for targeted spatial transcriptomics assay. And this is collaboration with the Discover um, as well as the Lungstel Atlas Consortium, particularly Kerstin uh, Meyer from Sanger and 
uh, Christus Herbert Martin Wang Pascal und Florimin. So the question is, if we have a, a disassociated single cell RNA seq setting, we have an unbiased observation of transcript, right? There might be an issue that we maybe drop some cell types, but essentially we should be able to know how to design probe sets for a targeted assay where we can maybe only measure 10 or 100 transcripts in such a way that we really recover our different cell types and robust fashion. But that's not the only question. And I think it's really important to, to think about that, right? If it was only about differentiating cell types, which in many cases is our core application, yes, that's kind of clear. We would be just selecting some type of efficient encoding of market. But in addition, within a cell type, we're sometimes really finding interesting variation. It could be like a transitional process, could be like split up by cell uh, uh, cycle of things like that. So in addition to differential, we also want to keep within a cell type the, the intrinsic variation. So this is sort of two requirements that we asked for this process. And this is what we came up with a selection procedure as well. So for one, we add some constraints. Yeah, we filter a bunch of, of genes that maybe just are not sufficiently high or low expressed for your particular um, target design. There's very different requirements for different spatial assays. But once you have this, uh, you would be doing a differential expression analysis to do some type of learning. In this case, just a simple random forest. There's different ways to do this, uh, to then distinguish cell types. In addition, though, within cell types, we also look at the main variability genes and add those as well. So we, that's how we define the probe sets. And then we sort of also make sure um, that they are um, sufficiently diverse in terms of sequence. And that's just the set that, that this, this method uh, spools out. And in order to evaluate what this gives us, we also compare now how good we are keeping variability about identifying cell types and also how fast this whole thing is. So that's what we did. We've been applying this to um, a human lung data set from Kessling Meyer and Sarah Teichmann's lab from Sanger, where we had a reference uh, where we have 8,000 disassociated RNA seq samples and then probe sets that have been specifically targeted on 150 genes. And that's what people we actually then didn't get. So we actually did it for 50 as well as 100. And our method, which we call SPA pros for sparse probe set selection, optimizes both for cell type identification, um, actually does a quite good job versus just something as straightforward as differential expression. Differential expression, you know, does a very good job at cell type classification, not as good as ours, but you know, does, 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 does well. There's different metrics that you can choose or just look at the blue ones on average, but it doesn't keep the variability as nicely as, 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 as this method. And there's a few things such as PCA, which does a good job here, but not so well here. And some also a little bit published things, but that sort of not work in the exact direction. So this is good and it actually holds also 150 genes. So we're quite happy with this. We hope to bring this out and buy archive soon. And happy if someone wants to try it out to, to, to share. Here's an example that we've been applying this to a screenshot um, um, targeted essay, similar to Katana, from fine grain, where in red for each of the different lung cell types, you see a gene expression for, for the various cell types. In blue, you see the same recovery of the targeted essay in the spatial setting. And you see we do a very good job actually at, at capturing also with this targeted spatial assay what we have in, in, the, in the single cell RNA seq setting. And you see that we can identify the cell types quite well in this particular setting. So we're happy um, about this general approach actually captures not only cell type variation and uh, cell type classification, but also captures variation. And actually I should have, should include this example. I haven't done so, but we find within one of these cell types, you find a variation that is spatially delocalized in different regions that you wouldn't have found if you just used the targeted assay. What we're currently doing, we've been trying this on other spatial assays and also build these, these target marketing for whole um, atlases. So that was my, my, my first vignette. Um, if there's some questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, we'll just move on. So this was for the pre-processing part. As a second part, now I wanna speak about cell-cell communication. Again, it's gonna get a tad technical, but I, th I think it's really fun because, you know, in spatial assays, we've been for a long time putting effort into using rather flexible machine learning tools, particularly deep learning tools for analyzing images, right? In the RNA seq setting, this is just sort of slowly emerging. And let me maybe point out maybe some, some things in between. Before I start, though, I want to briefly re reference this, 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 re this perspective review uh, from uh, Akarishi and, and, and Peter Sorger, uh, just recently coming up in Nature Methods, which, which are called differential biology. Where they've been advocating this type of flexible machine learning, deep learning for finding molecular mechanisms, which I think is kind of a bit of an anachronism, right? This is like the super flexible machine learning thing that can do all kinds of things, but you know, it's not known for being interpretable mechanistic. But I think they have a point here, and a lot of us have been thinking of constraining our models with additional mechanisms. 
And this is actually what happens in that field. Without now explaining all of these things in detail, the typical network structures that we do, they often encode additional features of the data. For example, if it's spatial data, you add pixel neighborhood information. It's called a convolution. If it's a 3D um, graph, you add then some type of equivariancy. If it's, if it's sequence, you add something like that. So there's all kinds of these ideas around and they're super important for making these things so flexible and actually uh, um, doable in this case. So what, what they advocate is then to maybe combine this very data-driven thing that's typically machine learning with some of these principles that we have to then build all of these sort of combined type of approaches. I won't, won't say more to that, but I think this idea of adding priors to our analysis is exciting. And a few of, a few of us have been taking this step and adding this section to the thing. And I, I wanna show in, in the next few slides how we've been doing this for the spatial setting. Um, so, so what's the architecture that we use? So that, um, in contrast to normal computer vision, in our case, particularly, and now I'm just speaking first in this one slide here on this associated case, we usually don't have labels for you for each single cell. You know, we just have many of those and we want to find some structure. This is called unsupervised learning because we don't have labeled data. The type of approach that we, that we and many use is taking gene time cell matrices and feeding them through this autoencoder structure. Um, which was first introduced uh, to, to, to the field uh, in, in, in to sort of back to back uh, by Akash from, from Yosef and, and, and my lab, where we've been essentially taking now this, this, this thing, squeezing it down, blowing it up again, and then just recovering the loss. A very known thing in machine learning. So you want to sort of make this thing as possible, uh, as similar as possible to the input, but because you squeeze it through this bottleneck, you sort of lose information. And often this bottleneck can really recover the interesting stuff, but because you know you, you sort of squeeze it up here, cleans up data, and sort of makes things more smooth. In particular, here this botnik learns interesting functions. So um, this sounds like a tool to do, but it's also a bit complicated to use and it might not be the best. But interestingly, and 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 for this, uh, together with many partners, amongst others, uh, Smita Krishna Swami from from Yale uh, and, and and a few companies, we've been running this uh, a competition at a recent machine learning conference, at the biggest one actually in Europe. called it's called where we did the data integration competition and more than 280 scientists take, took part of this and all winning models of these different tasks about integration, mapping across modalities, we're using neural networks. So these things are flexible and I think hard to beat on the long run because they just eat up so much data. So now you can ask, reflecting to this prior slide on differential biology, that we could maybe add again priors to this latent space to make it more interpretable. And we've been, for example, trying to do this early on with one approach where we've been trying to learn shifts of cell type under perturbation. And we're able to then, you know, if you, for example, don't measure one perturbation, one cell type, then be able to predict that effect. We've been now using this to study larger scale perturbation assays, going to this first question, how we introduced, how cell make decisions under many perturbations. How, how does this help us in the spatial case? In the spatial case, how can we add priors about the latent space? And there, you know, the cells are not just as a statistical IID, so independent, but there are some dependencies here. Maybe there might be neighbors, right? So this is the this is the idea. And the questions we would be asking is what's the equivalent of, of a cell type in the spatial setting? I mean, it's not a single cell, it needs to be some local context, some type of niche. How do and how could we use unsupervised learning in this, this spatial case? And um, so for this, one potential approach is what we call uh, node-centric expression models. This is worked by Sorry, I should put the, 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 the pictures of David Fisher and, and Anna Shah, two, two PhDs in the lab. We'll be seeing that David will be actually joining the blog very soon. Where we've been trying to now do this spatial representation and using what's called graph neural networks. So let's, let's take here an, an, an image of uh, um, a multimodal image. This could be a targeted essay or also something uh, untargeted, but you don't want to have a single cell resolution. We've been trying to do this also for deconvoluted visium. It's a nice show in, in a minute, but essentially we segment the data we get the different the segments out and then we try to just to mine for interactions of these. And it might be sort of, for example, here, cell-cell communication interaction type happening. What we now do is depending on, on, on sort of different resolutions, we make those things more coarse-grained, more fine-grained. We ask, uh, we build this contact network of cells touching each other across different resolutions. So it might be larger and smaller. And then we try to ask if we assign cell types, can we now, just based on the cell type of a cell, as well as its neighbors, predict the expression of that particular cell? So we look at the cell as well as its neighbors, and then say, can we then predict the gene expression? So this is the function we do. For each of those different cells, we want to predict gene expression based on it and its niche, okay? And you sort of expand the niche and make it smaller. And that's why 
you can then add this directionality to this. And you might be actually learning about sort of uh, uh, receiver to sender effects and so on. So that's the, that's the thing in short, and you, know, you can then make this not linear as with this as a typical approach. But in many cases, because our data sets are typically small, even just linear approaches are doing a good job. So this would be, for example, an application to Mibitov data. Um, so uh, um, um, I, um, I'm a more uh, protein-based approach, where I think in this case uh, was done in, in uh, colorectal carcinoma across different cell types. We then just look at the different positions of the cell type clusters and then build this graph as interactions. Similar, and I'll show you a few examples across different techniques. We've been doing this for Murphish data here of, of mouse brain, where we've been again looking at different layers and then be building this interaction uh, graph network. And now what we find, and uh, I think this is interesting is that we can go across the different scales now of this analysis. So just changing the scale of what we allow, if, if you have a scale zero, it means that there's no context. So it's just gonna be, it's gonna be completely ignoring the local context. A space of, uh, of, 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 of 6,000 uh, mu means essentially, you know, just like taking the whole image. So there's no information of space here, no information of space here. And interestingly now, we ask how much intracell type variation this model explains. And it's kind of subtle, but across many different, multiple different runs, it always peaks at a natural range of a few cell lengths. And this does not only hold in the Murphish data, but it's consistent across a whole bunch of imaging techniques from chip cytometry to this Mibitov example in cancer that I showed you before, now as, as well as codex. There's always a, 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 a sort of a, a interesting region um, of, 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 of this network. Back. Hi. Sorry for that. So there's, there's, there's always this this interesting region where there's some structure there. And now uh, we can apply this also in the deep deconvoluted uh, case for spot transcriptomics and try to learn then about interaction of uh, these 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 cells to to neighbors. And he's been doing some analysis in that, but I think I'm going to skip that and um, just come to. Uh, the, the third vignette that I want to show, namely the analysis framework that we now have, have been setting up to actually do these type of analysis. So you can use spatial information to learn about context, but what we realized also in this particular uh, prior work, because we've been doing this across multiple different um, essays, it's always hard to really build uh, like a unified type of uh, analysis. And there's no like in this associated case, we have these structures such as the NData and, 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 and ScanPy and all or Sirat and R, where we have sort of standard ways how to work. It's not as easy in the spatial setting. So we've been trying to sort of do this uh, ScanPy thing for us in space, just to organ get organized in the lab. And I was lucky that the Giovanni Pala and Hannah Spitzer, a PC and postdoc in the lab, essentially teamed up with, 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 with the lab in a, in a recent hackathon that we did, and then came up with, with this a structure that we call SquidPy, which, is, which essentially eats up all kinds of uh, spatial omics data sets across different imaging techniques, and essentially an interface is also the pre-processing techniques. Like you would do if you were doing 10X or SmartSeq2 and so on, you would not actually pre-process it here. You have different pre-processing, but then you just like work with the count matrix. And similar here, there's different pre-processing tools that then end up giving us then count data that we will just feed into SquidPy. Once we have this, we actually store them in usual end data format and in and, and a spatial graph that, you know, now each of these end data dots that would be a cell or maybe also spot in the Visium case, we just connect by our neighbor. But in addition, uh, we also store if it's available, let's say, uh, HNE stain or some type of image about potential morphometry as well. And then, uh, you know, if we look around what's currently happening, and I've been reviewing some of these methods uh, before in our perspective, right? It's about image processing, deconvolution, spatially uh, feature mapping. Many of, of these things, once you have the structure, you can sort of standardize. And so we've been trying to do here. So we've been coming up with a visualization. I'm going to show you a, a movie about that in, in a minute. But also an analysis for looking for spatial neighborhoods, for testing, for ligand reception interactions, also doing a spatial statistics. And because you have this image data, you can also do image features and you can interface with um, sort of the typical machine learning uh, Python ecosystem that, that you're used to uh, dealing with uh, spatial data anyway, and sort of exposes this via, via this object. All right. Um, so what this, what this framework um, uh, enables for you is really sort of this access to spatial mapping for simple structures, also more complex 
uh, generic structures. And a typical process will be to sort of put data in this image container, do some pre-processing, smoothing, um, conversion, maybe a segmentation. We have some very simple watershed one included as well as custom deep learning based ones or linked to other uh, tools such as cell post status. And you can extract features from that. Once you have this, you put this in the Zen data and you visualize it. So this would be a typical analysis that you could be doing in, in a script. Part. So for example, I mean, there's a lot of tests around in the statistical field, in particular for learning about spatial dependencies. No need to do something super fancy as this graph nerves that should be before to get started with. For example, you can, you can ask which genes are actually really strongly variable. And your spatial autocorrelation is usually something that picks it up for you. You can then build clusters based on that. You can look for cell receptor interactions across different clusters. And we've been um, um, implementing a cell phone DB version that's robust that allows you to do this, this spatial pickup within squid pair as well. And, but you can also, so you do something with the uh, image information. So to those of you maybe more from computational pathology, pathology is not such a big deal and you might be very much used to that, but people come from the transcriptome side, usually it's sort of not as straightforward what you, be doing, what you would be doing with that. So you have our vision data and we have the h &E and behind that all fluorescent image. And you know, this would be sort of the various steps that we're doing in terms of processing, going to the segmentation and also feature extraction. In each of these steps, you can see how, how it works and you can sort of do this in a very standardized fashion from from the toolbox, and then you can leverage also this spatial information. So this local shape of, let's say, of, of cells is always a new modality for some type of downstream analysis. So you can build clusters of, 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 of the particular gene expression across one spot, but you also have the image features and you can sort of group cells by similar morphometry. And they actually look different, right? And morphometry is sort of changing in a more strange fashion. And then you can do some type of machine learning and coding of those clusters, for example, learning them uh, from, from what's called ResNet. This is it's one of uh, um, sort of common analysis for encoding image structure in computer vision. Very generic one, not, not specific to microscopy. You can do some analysis of that. I'm gonna, gonna skip that, but you can also do deconvolution. For example, tangram or cell to location, take a reference atlas, you take the cortex from visible and special coordinates, and then you can get to deconvolve cell type proportions within that framework in sort of one setting and get the segmentation up. So this is just sort of an, an um, an interface to this, this Tangram tool um, that I think this recently also came out to work from, from Aviv's lab as well. And now um, there's a bunch of viewers around. We're not the best by any means of, of doing graphical use interfaces. So we've been building an interface uh, to Napari, which is sort of very useful, very, very scalable, fun uh, image viewer that then allows you to sort of have layers here, pick up particular genes, then highlight, for example, here this vision example that I showed you before. Can zoom in, uh, look around, uh, play around with the layer settings to see the background H and E stain as well, and then you can zoom in and also highlight particular annotations from your uh, end data object and explore this and see where it's localized, where your clusters are, where these other type of features that we've been discussing just before uh, are, are lying around. So I think that that could be potentially useful. But you can also then do something with that and potentially pick up a particular region that you're interested in. So let's say highlight a bunch of genes that you might be interested in, see where they are. And then you'll know, select a subset of those and uh, then say, hey, this is gonna be the subset of, of cells that I want to do a downstream analysis. So you do a spatial subsetting and then you have this in your end data. You call this maybe hippocampus or something like that as this particular example. And then you have them here and then you do something with that, right? Now you have it in ScanPy and then you can you know, just quickly uh, plot that, but then also um, look into particular statistics. All right. I'm just saying, you know, we've been putting quite some effort in the, the code and it's nice to use and it's documented and so on. I think it's a bit technical. And so, 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 so that's, that, that's a toolbox as it currently is. There are of course some limitations to it and we've been sort of making an effort to, to make this flexible. But of course, you know, we, we only, it's, it's not as easy yet to do really molecular level representation. For us, the, the sort of standard unit we deal with is, is, is cells, but if you're really interested in the subset liberation, as I mentioned before, we need to do some more work and we can actually sort of start to do this. For very large microscopic images, I think maybe the way you think that is not the, the best one. We're thinking about that, uh, working with, with CCI to, to, to make an Apari plugin uh, for the thing. And you know, we think also the registration part can be done better. So there's a bunch of things that we're currently doing. We're, for example, trying to interface this with the uh, OMI uh, and next generation file format for imaging. It gets a bit technical, so I'm just gonna skip that. But we, we're really trying to make things sort of work in that environment. Um, we've been, also putting some type of better plotting to that that goes beyond just the typical things that you know from uh, a visual and sort of, so for example, allowing also different types of 
morphometries or shapes that you could design spots with because this is sort of what people do with different essays. And we've been also trying to sort of make it more interfaced with existing, existing spatial frameworks in particular sort of earlier things. We're doing a bunch of tutorials. We just did one in, in Basel and there's gonna be a single cell omics uh, Germany tutorial coming up. I believe actually next Monday, Tuesday, I should have packed that in. So if someone's interested, I think we have already something like 400 people coming to the thing, it's really exciting. Um, but please uh, let us know. We're really happy to still fit you in. It's gonna be as always an online thing. So <laughs> let's see how that works. We, we've been trying to put a bunch of people in the paper as well. So that, that's what I wanted to, to say about SquidPy in the remaining five minutes or so. Let me say uh, uh, a little bit what we've been trying to do with spatial variation going beyond just sort of cellular variation. I think this is sort of an interesting story because you know once we have a method to study variation, I think we can sort of do it across scales and then potentially maybe even connect scales. Here we've been looking at a data set. Um, actually we've been setting up a collaboration with Priska Liberali uh, from, from uh, um, Basel, who's been making this beautiful uh, set of gut uh, organoids uh, in a very, very large setting. So she has this high content image-based screen, not very multimodal, uh, but she's been monitoring organoids across uh, growth and then labeling, I believe, uh, some type of cycling, progenitor cells, panic cells, as well as enterocytes with different colors. And uh, then she's been just like doing many, many organoids, something like two to 300,000 across then also perturbations um, with like more than a thousand drugs. So that's sort of one of these data sets that I think it could be really exciting to study first what's the variation for organs, but then how do these variations sort of change under the And just be doing an analysis uh, based on sort of calculating morphometries with a bunch of features and then looking how these features. And just been able to sort of give different labels of, of this type of states. But we've been, I think, can we do an unbiased version of, of that type of analysis? And this is what we've been trying to do here. So we replace these engineered features by a fully data-driven one. As we've been trying to do in the single as I said, not going to markers, but really trying to sort of let the whole data learn and tell you what the variations look for clusters of those cell types and so on. But now you can look in, into uh, not cells, but whole organoids in terms of variation. So that's what we've been doing. Is this uh, the, the sort of main project that Giovanni now took up, where we take now, again, the same type of architecture as I showed you before of this autoencoder with additional structure here, but now because they are images, you know, use a spatial one. So use a convolution uh, um, autoencoder. We've been trying different versions of that. It's a bit technical, I won't go into details for that. But what we can do is we can now look at the real ones and we can reconstruct with this autoencoder those in a very, very, very detailed fashion. Now that we can do this, we don't need features, but we have now here this representation that gives us this landscape of organ variation. So this is, this is what we've been trying to do. So we've been putting some, some tests into that. This is going to be technical, so I'm going to skip that, just show you the results of, of this reconstruction. So again, here you see, for example, two um, organoids that are particularly, uh, yeah, I, I should say blue highlights a nuclei, red highlights panic cells and enterocytes. And you see sort of here um, some, some of, of these, these, these localizations of them and some, some, some budding regions. You can see that our prediction, so this interpolation, robustly reconstructs it. And because this one now has a data representation to it, we can do this across multiple ones. So we can now look at the whole set of 400,000 so organoids and plot all of them. And then we see that they sort of differ across different points. And there's sort of, there's different ones being localized different regions of this landscape. And we can calculate the super time starting from this sort of early uh, developmental uh, budding uh, um, organoid here, and we can do this across many ones. And what you see is, yeah, here, see, this is where it starts. This is sort of where they get arrested. This is then called an entrocyst, right? But that's some region where there's high panel cells, and you see then the, these, these terminal mature ones here, some with increased self renewal and so on. So I think that's really nice. So we sort of see it something like a yeah, transitionary process, but now here also in organ duration, we can do this a bit more technical. You know, we, we can sort of do our usual uh, interaction graphs, learn super times and so on. I, I won't go to details for that, but I want to just uh, wrap up. So to conclude, I've uh, been discussing a little bit how to address the computational challenge of finding components of spatial variation, initially in disassociated setting, then adding spatial context. And then the very last part, also speaking about variation on high levels in the organoid shape. And I think if we really try to approach this idea of modeling tissue, 
I, I think quantifying what these higher order variation units are and being able to put them together, I think is going to be exciting. So this is interesting from the math point of view. We've been using some techniques such as graph neural networks to do this, but we've been also building some type of sort of software really to do this and solving this machine learning problem of process selection. And what we're currently working on is then really doing more interpretation of these latent spaces, in particular adding innovations uh, to do so. I've been acknowledging our collaboration partners as well as the students doing so. So I'm just left uh, showing my lab. This is what my lab usually looks like when the weather's nice in Bavaria. We have those beautiful mountains. Please know that you're allowed to travel and uh, consider coming by. And I thank you very much for your attention. Yep. Thank you so much, Fabian. So super uh, fascinating. It's a lot of cool tools. <laughs> Yeah, in particular, I love all the safest <laughs> tools. So, um, so this uh, kind of webinar is pretty kind of informal, interactive. If you have questions, feel free to unmute and ask uh, Fabia. And I say, Alex, you want to ask question? Otherwise, I can get a yeah. <laughs> Hi, Fabian. Thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, I had a question. I, I was really interested in your sort of interaction sphere finding at 100 microns. Uh, a small question is, you know, what, what do you think that means for, for three dimensions in extrapolation? But the other question I had was, you know, if that's sort of specific to families of uh, markers or proteins or transcripts, right? Like you can imagine there's short range interactions versus long range. Can, can you resolve that? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So this is, of course, quite quite naive how we get started. And um, I also have to be honest that we didn't have the largest number of samples because what we really need in order to make sure that we robustly find these ranges ideally is many replica of one particular case. And there's like not so many replications of, let's say, a Visium or a Murphysh or data sets available, at least not to us. We've been at least now starting to team up a bit to make research. I think you make two very, very important points. Right? We've been not doing this on a filtered data set, but we've been really trying to use essentially um, cell type quantification, trying to read all kinds of gene expression. But I think what, what you, of course, uh, argue here, and I think could be quite well true, would be interesting to see is there maybe like a close scale delta not type of interaction versus a much longer I mean, wind gradient or something like that, right? Um, yeah, we've been thinking a little bit about that, but it hasn't been super clear how to include. So what we've been actually modifying the model at the moment is to only allow interactions across specific ligand receptor pairs. And with this, we can then probe what's actually driving this interaction. Um, and we find a few things in, 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 in Vision, um, but I, I think I think this, this can be improved. And we have not really looked into um, a three-dimensional setting because of course, you're right. Uh, in this case, it would be better, not sure. If they're the, the very large um, examples of, let's say, a 3D multi sliced Visium or something like that available, I guess maybe other brain. You know, yeah. good, good point. I, I had a follow up question, and if that's okay, I, 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 I'm not a machine learning person, but you, know, you mentioned prior. So, is, is it possible to incorporate, I don't know, like keg pathways or, or something like that in, into your priors to, to get closer to the, you know, marker specific ranges. Yeah, thanks for that. So this was not planned. We have not really uh, spoken about it before, but actually that's what we did. So we had like, we just brought up one thing which we call XP map. Uh, um, let me put it there. So this is just a bio archive yet. But um, yeah, I, I mean, we all know that these these, these type of paths and so on, they're somewhat naive, right? And you know, manual annotation doesn't hold across all cell types and so on. I think in principle, it's, it's, it's really useful because it gives names to groups of cells or groups of, 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 of genes, right? So it's, it's, I think, a useful concept that really helps us understand things better. So I just put the bioarchives there. So what we've been doing essentially there is instead of in the latent space, just allowing all kinds of projected gene sets, we've been just grouping them by CAC pathways. And there have been similar approaches um, I think Trey Eideke had something recently, which we called biologically informed neural networks, where you've been sort of encoding the CAC pathway hierarchy directly into uh, the encoding thing. I think this one, what we have here is a tad more flexible, but the idea I think is, is around, and he, I mean, he and others have been using just for classification, you've been using this for latent space learning, but you can interpret those coordinates now much better. Yeah, so that's actually important. But of course, all of this, nothing comes for free. So machine learning, whenever you add priors, you also add a bit of a bias to the thing. And, 
I think is good, right? I mean, if you ask for hypothesis, we add ask a biased question, in a sense. And I think that's, that's sort of what, what happened in this case also. We haven't done this though for the spatial case. So this was only for the disassociated setting. Thank you. So Pat, uh, Pat, you have your hand up. Well, hi, um, thanks for the excellent talk. I was actually also interested in kind of the cell-cell interaction discussion. Has there been thought to looking at, I guess, cells taking in inputs from multiple different possible, I guess, a receiver cell taking inputs from multiple different possible sender cells? Because it seems to me mm. that a lot of the methods seem to focus on kind of either aggregation of cells based on type or kind of almost one-to-one -one interactions. Yeah, that's a good point. So actually, this ligand receptor mod, particularly, they really just want one interaction. If you then look a little bit what they predict, it's often pretty much of a hairy ball where you know, a lot of things are connected. Because, yeah, sure, you do find a lot of ligands repressed, expressed in one cell that could have a receptor in the other one, even though they might be actually interacting. So you, you have a point. It would be interesting to look for triples or higher order interactions. This is what this method automatically does. So these, these I mean, you know, the graphs are not just on a neighbor, but it connects it to all kinds of neighbors. So essentially what our model does, it's a function of, so you want to predict that cell type's expression as a function of the cell types of its neighbors. So it automatically takes many into account. To be honest though, how we interpret it is then we project back to two because it's just easier to understand. It's going to be very hard to look for these things. And I also feel we still need to sort of really maybe scale this up in a high dimensional so sort of into more samples to really then find these triples, but you know, I've been always, I mean, we have some examples where we see then sort of, a, um, let's say a T cell in a particular cancer case where it sort of tries to fight that. And some of these things pop up, but it's not as as super clear. So I think that that needs some, some, some more. Yeah, I think in your assembled cell uh, sequencing data, if you perform uh, ligand receptor interaction, that's always like a hairball, right? Uh, yeah. When you perform like a, a spatial sequencing data, they can really step in interaction. You can do kind of spatial uh, constraint, uh, they can accept interaction. So they have to be in the same or in a vicinity. Uh, so in that case, I wonder um, if I have done anything like that. Um, so what then I'm going to see, sort of, uh, for example, the, the paracrine signaling uh, mm -hmm. ligand receptor interaction, you see, oh, that's a little bit longer range interaction. You can you can see this is, um, and uh, if the like a PD one, PDL one, they have to make contact. In that case, that mm -hmm. unique uh, cell structure or cell cell interaction structure is much shorter range. And if that's really kind of hormone uh, or metabolite like a glucose, that could be even longer range. I don't know if if you have kind of seen that or the possibility to see something like that. We've been, we've been exploring a little bit with this, this graph-based approach, but as I said, this uh, this is uh, we've kind of sort of make this homogeneous across different methods. But I think to answer this question, to get started with at least, uh, we've been really just doing spatial statistics, right? Because you know you might if you really sort of very clear in one particular question to say you know how is this let's say enzyme that's maybe regulating this one particular metabolic pathway, how is this localized and how would it sort of change those things? And that's a very detailed question that you can then ask it into, formulate into a spatial autocorrelation thing or something like that. And this is, you can very quickly ask within the pie. So, you know, you can ask, formulate very clear tests for, for, for doing this and then, then coming, coming up with, with such things. I guess we need to get used a little bit more to that, just not doing differential expression as we usually did in this associated case. Yeah. But I think these things will be will be coming up more. Yeah. Okay, I see a question in the chat box uh, from mm -hmm. Tom Wang. Uh, do you think uh, if it is possible to take autocrine or endocrine into account? Mm -hmm. I think that's the same question kind of I ask. I'm asking because cell cell communication does not mm -hmm. only happen between neighboring cells. Yeah. Kind of along the I same mean, the line. autocrine part, that's, that, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So, this we haven't mm -hmm. really, really formulated. I mean, well, we do have an autocrine thing in there because we say we want to predict the, the expression of a cell not only based on its neighbors, but also of its own uh, cell type. So, it's really involved. 
um, but we and we do see sort of errors going in both directions. So I guess we could have an approximation to the paracrine situation as well when they sort of you know talk uh, to to each other. Um, so yeah, so I think in, in, in principle, it is in included in that model. Um, but so this thing is in revision, in revision, we've been sort of really building this into a sort of more flexible thing, but we then actually also add particular ligament receptors. But for the, I think for this step, that's then maybe the, the, the way to answer that. Um, it would be interesting for us to have, I mean, if, if someone's interested in this, uh, to have a really very specific data set where you potentially know one or the other which we can then also have probe and sort of find, find additional ones. I have the impression that the current state of the um, cell interaction type of model in this associated case is sort of a bit stuck. That's why I'm quite excited about adding this case. So uh, I have a question as we wait. Uh, I think fantastic job, Fabian. Uh, you've talked about from the design all the way to the end the point of the pipeline. Right, and my question is about cloud-based processing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is this deep cell, I think there are websites for even for cell poles and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> so do you have some ideas about, you know, where we should be going with this? Like, can we write just like get codex data or, you know, spatial data and any data and upload it and get the graphs, right? Where are we with this right now? I mean. I think you are the best person yeah. to probably take us to the <laughs> next step. <laughs> I really like that you asked this because, you know, this is such a technical question that we often don't ask ourselves how to do it. But as soon as we need to compare our thing with something else or sort of put it into context, we really need to address these questions. And, you know, early on, I realized that many students in, in the lab so just re-download the thing and have it sort of lying around in one or the other way. And you know, even within the lab, you know, it's kind of not so super forward, straightforward how to share these things, let alone that across community. You know, what we've been trying to do, and you know, this has been a big endeavor of the human cell atlas of HubMap and so on. And Raul has this beautiful, beautiful Azimuth that is actually contributing to quite quite a few of these questions. We've been building up um, a decentralized port that sort of just lets you load from all different places, such as from CCI, HCI, and so on, uh, which we call Sphira. I just put it in here. Um, that works very well for the disassociated case because there are also data sets that are not so large. How to do this for images? Like in particular, like not talking about just multimodal points that are connected by a graph because that's like a process thing. That's going to be small again. But yeah, really keeping the images. I mean, that's going to be a mess. We just Yesterday we had a, a CCI workshop, AI and ML, neurodegenerative disease. And there was a colleague, Steve Finkbein, who was actually saying that Whenever he does, when he does grants, you know, things work out. But then once he wants to, needs to share the data, it goes into even petabyte range for him. And he just like doesn't have resources to do so. So I think that that's gonna be tough to, to really address. And yeah, I'm I'm not not, a, not an expert on that. Um, our solution at the moment is like we make squid by compatible to a standard in the Ruby community. But what's the GEO equivalent or the um, array express equivalent in microscopy? Not so clear. So they have at least some formats that are getting there, but yeah, maybe one they, option, maybe right? Anything. Exactly. So one option maybe is that they'll get the data, but then right away it's gonna process the CV, CSV file or some other file format and dump mm. the rest, right? Trash the rest of the images, right? Because as you mentioned, you cannot uh, save them. I mean, unless you know you have really unlimited storage. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah I mean, that's, that's also what we raised. And, and you know, pathologists then kind of argued, yeah, visually we can maybe say how much we can learn and maybe we stop. But it's exciting what these deep learning algorithms actually also find in an image that you wouldn't expect. So they are very reluctant to trust things. We're not like as in astronomy where it's very clear that these are the right questions. So oh, yeah, yeah, let's see how this goes. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. I think Lana has a question. Yes, yes, Fabian, wonderful. Nice to meet you. Hi. So nice I have one you. question. You know, um, this has been bothering me for a while. I, I'm, I'm sure many folks here share the similar um, thoughts as well. You know, spatial transformics is really like eye-opening to give us a very fine resolution of what's going mm -hmm. on at the cell or subcellular level, including interactions, uh, signaling, etc. Um, but the technology is, by, uh, is uh, pricey, right? And the sampling spot mm -hmm. is really small. So it's really hard to scale up. 
And on the other hand, the, you know, for clinicians, they're dealing with, uh, with patients and then they have to make the medical decisions, uh, what drug to give to patients. Um, yeah. So how do you see, you know, how can we kind of, kind of bridge the gap between different technologies to be able to uh, help inform the clinicians to treat the patients in the future? Because I, th I think this will be a great place for spatial omics data, maybe by marrying with some other, other methods like, like a histopathology and some other things, we could kind of take advantage of, of each, but then somehow kind of homogenize or, or, or minimize the, the, the weakness of the different technologies to move forward. I, I, I really love your question. I think it's such an important point. Um, I, I think this obviously does not scale. I mean, let's be honest, even the transcriptome side of things is used very rarely in clinical setting, let alone then spatial transcriptomics, right? Um, well, to be honest, I don't even know any clinical use yet of that. So it's always just gonna be something projected, right? But fact-based analysis with a few markers, I mean, that's a like common, super common tool in immunology, right? And also in clinical diagnostics. So I think, the future needs to be a long projection of important information. We just measure so many things that are redundant, correlated, but maybe not decisive for the particular disease situation, maybe not even just that interesting. So we need to find methods to project away the boring part. And you know, the boring part could be this, this manifold where like, there's, like this is a big cube 20,000 dimensional or maybe also spatial resolved, but you know, then this, this sort of the real information is much lower dimensionally correlated. And like, you know, as we do now, if we were doing genomics, like, uh, if we do genetics, like looking at, 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 at DNA variation, we would never be reassembling a whole genome in a new person. Uh, I think wrong, <laughs> you said you also use uh, this, this analogy, right? Yeah. So maybe we'd be just mapping. And I hope mm -hmm. at some point we also have this, like this genome browser for our spatial data, or maybe at least for the disassociated case, where you, know, you have a, a lane for ATAC, you have a lane for protein, you have a for this. And you know, some of these things you can just learn from each other. So we've been, for example, showing that if you only have RNA, you can actually impute quite a few of site seek expressions on the protein side. So you might need to measure this. And I think as soon as it gets targeted, then maybe with maybe also efficient sequencing protocol, we don't need to pay a big, huge 10x experiment, but it's just, we're just gonna maybe sequence 10 genes or something like that. And it's maybe sufficient. And I think people do this already in the spatial case for proteomics. I think codex and so on, if I understand correctly, as well as type of, I think people start using already in the clinical setting. Is that correct? At least the clinical research setting, yes. Uh, I, I would not be Research surprised, yeah, yeah if, after a couple of years, the trial is done, and uh, we're going to really imprint, implement some multivariant biomarkers out of codex in clinical decision. That's totally possible. Mm -hmm. Unless I think there's a question. I, I have a <clears throat> technical question uh, it's, it's in relationship to your GNNs. So the data mm -hmm. is pretty sparse. And I wonder if you do any type of dimensional reduction of TCA before you actually construct the vectors associated with each node of your network. And in addition, you mentioned also the problem of deconvolution. So if you have to do a deconvolution, how do you re really reconstruct your graph? Do you actually have the, use a graph that is based on the location of the centroid of the cells? If you have to do deconvolution, you don't know where the cells are located perhaps. And uh, yeah, yes. this, is, this is one question. And the other question is, uh, two other questions. Uh, in graphs, as you alluded in the beginning of your talk, uh, equivariances could help a lot in the performance of the graphs. And I'm not sure how stable, how, how stable are your results in, because of this sparsity that I mentioned before. And adding the equivariance probably can save you a little bit of this type of stability. And I don't know how much you experimented with that. And the third question is related to the fact that indirectly you can infer multi-scale information from the graphs. And from what I understood from your presentation, you actually discovered only phenomenon at, at, at more or less at one length scale. And I wonder if you kind of, explore possibilities of output, different length scales, uh, information from the whole analysis. 
Th thanks, you These are three uh, um, very, very keenly observed and, and good points. And I'd love to discuss this in more detail as I maybe can now. Let me get started uh, with the various points. So the, the maybe starting with the last, the last one was about the equivariance and how we can sort of put this in the network or maybe have the, the multiple scales involved. I think at the moment, our approach is too coarse grained to really pick up as much because also those essays are not, so we haven't been doing this across, for example, a very big uh, a structure um, that you would be used to in a, a pathological situation, so in, in, in a, a pathology uh, um, um, readout. So I think there have been some papers now where people start stitching Murphy's type of data together and then they get really big. But in our case, the scale was not so big to really have it's a very large scale structure interacting with another one in a small scale one. So that's why uh, I don't think we have our current set of examples would be rich enough to, to really ask that. I think in principle though, you have a point, right? I mean, if you sort of increase the scale sort of connecting to a larger scale, uh, to, to, to sort of a larger environment, you should be able to learn this. We haven't seen that though. Uh, but also you know, in this first part I showed was just as basic as how much variance can you explain uh, by the particular scale. The second point you asked was about um, Visium data, which of course has essentially this, this big spot and within that spot, it's just not resolved. So, you know, the simplest thing we did, we just like fully connected, we had a fully connected network within this one and then we're doing analysis there. And if necessary, we're then connecting it across other spots, but that was the first analysis. So it was also very simplistic. Um, I think there's, there's definitely more to be done We've been essentially trying to to really better test this this type of approach in that setting, and we've been quite excited about a lot of these nonlinear extensions that we were doing. But in these big hyperparameter scans that we run, which we also learned are very expensive in to, to do in this uh, spatial setting because the data is so large, like quarter store we had before. Um, essentially, many cases left us with choosing the linear model as being sufficient already for explaining much of the variation. So I'm happy to, to follow up on that, but I think, uh, did that roughly answer your question? Yeah, the, the, I don't know also if you use the equivariance in your setup, but uh, this is something really technical. Yeah. So, so in, in my opinion, the equi, yeah. Yeah, that's maybe too simplistic. So what, what I, yeah. So what, so taking a step back, what I really want to do with this is actually find something like a, a, a local group of cells that are always reoccurring. It's just like an equivalent to the notion of a cell cluster of a cell type in this associated case. And I think for this one needs to potentially build in this occurrence. At the moment, sort of the only additional prior information that we used was this neighborhood information. It's not like per se equivalent, but the graphs are not, you know, the graphs are not spaced. There's not like an X, Y, you know, they're rotation invariant. So in some sense, I guess you could say just by using the graph, you have been putting it at least a spatial transformation equivalent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Carlos Price, uh, you have your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is, you kind of already hit on this already, but with um, analyzing these different space, all our different spatial technologies and spatial tools, um, some have their pros, some have their cons. Um, do you think we'll ever, do you think from an analysis standpoint, we'll get to a good point where we can kind of put it together? So the, the, way, the way I'm thinking about it particularly is from a like oncology standpoint, like every tumor you get, uh, regardless of what section you, you're at or different people's tumors are very different. So building like a full cancer atlas, it's gonna be impossible with one technology by itself, right? And it's gonna be all these people, all these groups with different technologies. And it seems that just from what you guys have presented and kind of what I've seen, it, it seems that putting it together might be a pipe dream, but I don't know if like you have this uh, any thoughts about that about like data integration across that to for one kind of common goal. I I really love. I I think we need to do this right. Um, there have been a bunch of ideas how to approach this, and I know this better in this associate setting because there we've been actually making the effort. For example, for this human lung cell atlas that we've been recently doing, we've been sort of coming up with an integrated version in this big consortium, and there we've been integrating it across uh, normal 10x, smart sig two, and other types of assays. Also, uh, nucleus and I think there was a nucleus data set as well, and a cytosolic one. 
So we showed that you know you can actually map these different data sets for doing RNA seq together. That's probably not so super functional, but at least that worked. Or this one example that I, I gave before to, to Lana, where you also had the protein assay in addition to the RNA and, and part can actually then impute that. And actually, I, I just I, I just looked up this paper. There's this this guy called James Sue. I hope I um, do his last uh, name correctly. I'm just like looking up. The, he's been working a little bit on on these these questions in the um, spatial setting as well, trying to, um, for example, impute, uh, let's say, antibody distributions or so. You, you know this right mm -hmm. wrong, this antibody distribution just from spatial morphometry or so. So I think there's a lot of information, let's say, in house cells, and then you look at something like that about what particular cell type they are. And so I think there could be enough anchors to put some of these things together. I think what's crucial though, and I don't think this has been solved on the method side. So if someone has ideas that I'd be super excited about it. How do we deal with the uncertainties? You know, let's say we start squishing stuff together, there's necessarily gonna be some errors in there. How do we quantify these errors? So we had a paper recently, um, we, 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 we called this SC Arches. This was a uh, major biotech um, half a year or something like that ago. It was actually on cover recently, very happy about it. So, and, and, and uh, with, with that, we also did a, a transfer of labels, but we also been trying uh, out how robust this can get. And the uncertainty, the best answer we were able to give is about the prediction of the cell type labels. Because then you know, it's a predictive problem that we really know how to handle uncertainties. But for this representation learning, it's not as straightforward, at least not for us. So I think that could be an interesting avenue to follow. Yeah, very, very interesting. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm uh, giving uh, the, the time constraint. Uh, I think two quick questions in the chat box, uh, if uh, Fabio can answer. I think one is mm -hmm. the probe selection method. Uh, do you have preprint already? Kind of. Yeah, I've been wanting to have that, but we've been yeah. unfortunately not being as fast. So we really hope okay. we bring this out in the next few weeks. But if you want to try this out early on, so I'm really happy just send me an email. Okay, yeah, just uh, email to Fabian. <laughs> so next one is uh, also relatively quick. So for the cell city and edge, uh, my understanding is, uh, this is from Alex, my understanding, for example, in the endothelial cells, right? So just uh, on the uh, inner surface of the blood vessel. So in that case, how do you analyze the, the neighborhood? Because you have only one side of the cells as a neighbor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you're gonna get a biased answer if you don't show. So what you what you are saying? Do you think you should be basically building a method that has some type of censoring or so included? I mean, I guess that's what you need, right? In, in a sense. So dealing like like with with time series, at some point you just stop measuring, right? And then you know, rest is censored. Mm. You haven't thought about that. Do you think it's a it's a common case? Do you think it's important to do? Well, if I could chime in, I, I meant more like just on the edge of the tissue slice, right? Like you, you just have yeah. typically normal tumor cell. It's just missing half of its neighbors through no fault of its own. So, do you do you just let those guys sneak through as you know, truncated? Do you impute the rest of? I mean, I guess that's basically what happens naturally. Is you sort of. Exactly. So we just like do as if the graph stops. Like we don't sort of infinitely continue or something like that. So yes, there would be bound facts. And it, it might not be the most clever way. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned, I think the statistic a good way would be to do somehow impute, like impute or like, I mean, what, what do people do in, in, in computer vision deep learning? They just like zero pad the heck out of it, right? You know, it's like sort of add a bunch of things so that you can convolute. It's kind of also yeah. not correct because you know, and then they assume as if it's zero, but you know, it seems to be working. Um, but there must be better ways. I think about it. Yeah. Thanks. Note for that. A good point. So, Ame, you want to yes. kind of conclude? So, I think in the interest of time, I think we are wrapping up, I think, today. And uh, before we kind of think, uh, wrap up, I, let's think to the speaker again. Fabian, I think I'm going to use this clapping sign again. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the fantastic discussion. Really enjoyed that. It's so cool that so many people actually stayed also beyond time. Really appreciate the, the cool suggestions. We have already about 100 people, <laughs> even now. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. I think we really appreciate it taking time and staying a little late in also your place. Um, and before we wrap up, also, we'd like to announce that next week we have Dr. Charlotte Scott from uh, uh, University of Ghent. 
and she's going to talk about generating a special atlas of the healthy and obese liver across species. And with this, I think we are wrapping up today. And thank you, everyone, for participating. And hope to see you guys next week. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.